Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. He said this about not just disciples 2,000 years ago, but to men and women and children right here in Farmington, New Mexico in 2022. You are the salt of the earth, and that's supposed to change something about you and the way that you affect the world around you. My question is, are we actually doing that? And so let's, let's dig a little deeper and find out. Of course, salt hasn't changed much over the century, has it? So we know it acts as a pre, uh, preservative in that it enhances the flavor of food. I personally love salt, a lot of it. I don't like it by itself, but almost on everything else, it's delicious. And no doubt, as we live in and engage the world, God can use us as such to preserve things, to make things more tasteful, if you will. But let's think like Jews in the first century, because there's more to this. Is there another use for salt that the Lord's disciples would have instantaneously been familiar with and is lost on us? There is. You see, salt was used on a daily basis in all the offerings back in Jerusalem at the temple. And they used it as a constant reminder of God's covenant relationship. That was the whole part, point of it. We're in covenant relationship. In other words, he's saying, I unconditionally, sacrificially love you. And the proof is I'm going to give you something that gives you life preserves life, especially in that arid climate of Israel, right? I'm going to give you salt. You need this just to survive. And so it was precious like gold. We're told that Roman soldiers, legionnaires, they were sometimes paid in salt and they accepted it glad gladly. Why? Because you needed that to survive. And so that's what he's talking about. I love you. I'm in a relationship with you, my chosen people, Israel. And so when you make an offering, you season it with salt. And that's a reminder to you that, hey, our God loves us. We're good. And so do we see this in Scripture? Of course. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Notice what it says there. You shall season all of your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering with all of your offerings. So it wasn't just this one grain offering. Anything that they offered up to God, salt shaker, not really, but you know what I mean. They would, they would throw salt on it. Something that was very valuable to them, by the way. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. You shall be, be reminded God loves us this much. Boom, boom. Going a bit deeper, salt was also used in what was known as the peace offering. Because this, this is really where it, it's, it's coming down to. There, there's all these types of different offerings. There's grain offerings. There's burnt offerings. And they all come to this one head, if you will, to a peace offering. And what that meant between God's people and their God. Look at what it says, Leviticus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Here's the peace offering. If you want to present a peace offering from the herd, use either a bull or a cow. The animal you offer to the Lord must have no physical defects. It must be perfect, like a lamb, unblemished, right? Lay your hand on the animal's head and slaughter it at the entrance of the tabernacle. This was a transference of guilt, sin. My sin, now on you, unblemished, perfect. And then look at what they do. Aaron's sons, the priest, will then sprinkle the animal's blood against the sides of the altar. They sacrificed that sacrificial animal, spread the blood out. This is sounding very much so like our Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God. Verse 3, part of this offering must be presented to the Lord as an offering made by fire. This includes the fat around the intro. Uh, internal organs, the two kidneys with the fat around them near the loins and the lobe of the liver which is to be removed with the kidneys. The sons of Aaron will burn these on the altar on top of the burnt offering on the wood fire. It is an offering made by fire very pleasing to the Lord. And although it's not stated there, we've already learned from the other text in Leviticus that this too would have been seasoned with salt. Here's the peace offering. Why did they need peace? It's obvious. Let's get a perfect, unblemished animal. 
put hands on it, transference of guilt and sin, and then sacrifice it. And now we're going to offer it up as a burnt offering. Salt would have been added, a reminder, I love you this much. We're in relationship with one another. I'm not going to break that covenant with you. This is God talking to his people. And now it's offered up to God and it is very pleasing. Now then, hang, hang in here with me. This peace offering foreshadowed the coming of Christ and him fulfilling this peace offering perfectly. We see this in Colossians chapter 1, 19 through 20. Look at what it says. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile, there it is, those who were once enemies brought to peace together, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the peace offering seasoned with salt. In other words, the gospel itself. The gospel is the peace offering between a holy God and a sinful world. Now I get it. There's a lot of good we can do and should do in this world. We can feed the poor. We can and should stand up for the oppressed. We must call for justice when we see injustice. We should serve in our communities as police officers, nurses, on our school boards, substitute teachers. You name it, the church, God's people, should be engaged in all of those ways. But make sure you get this. It doesn't matter how much money you give the poor or all the food you provide for the hungry, the best schools, the safest communities, none of it will bring eternal eternal peace between God and God. In the world. No doubt, again, there's a lot of good you can and should do in this world, but proclaiming the gospel is the only truth capable of establishing eternal peace between God and man. And God has called you to be salt. He has called you to what is referred to in Scripture as the ministry of reconciliation. Let's look at that for a moment. Second Corinthians. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, let's stop right there because typically we do, right? When we read that verse, we just kind of hang there. Yeah, I'm a new creation. And, you know, and we just really, we think about what we want to think about. Like all those bad habits in my past, you know, I got this. God's got this. I'm a new creation. The old things have passed away. That's true enough. It's not what the text says afterwards. Look again. Read it with me again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now you should start asking yourself questions. In what way? Don't just insert it. Like, what does the text say? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Okay, the old things are gone. What's new about me? Verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is how I'm new. It's not like me dominating and having power over sin. It's not about me suddenly striking it rich. Praise Jesus. Do you see what I'm getting about? No, it's saying this, something that actually I see why we overlook this. This is hard because this is the priest offering salt before a holy God, standing in between sinful people, holy God, and like, hey, do you remember how much you love them? Here's the covenant salt. This is what you and I are called to do. This is what's new about you if you are in Christ. If there's one thing that should stand out about you to those around you, it's not that suddenly you're successful, perpetually happy, that your kids got all short haircuts and dress in suits. It's none of that nonsense, you know, that outward conformity to morality. That's not it. What should stand out more than anything else is your absolute zeal for being a minister of reconciliation. I'm going to go tell people about Jesus. That's what it's all about. 
Continue on. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the word to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us, to you, to me, to us, the message of reconciliation. This is what's new about us. This is what's supposed to be different about us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's what's supposed to be new about us. More than anything else. Five times the Apostle Paul uses that word reconciliation or some kind of, you know, something along that lines. Katalage is the word in Greek. It means to establish peace between enemies. This is how God has chosen to turn the world upside down. Through the bold and reckless proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through you and I, his church, taking salt, a peace offering, and telling others who Christ is and what he has done for them and how they too can be saved. Now then, real quick, I want you to answer this next question in your own mind. And I'm not trying to guilt trip you here. I just want you to wrestle with this for yourself, okay? So, so here's the question. When was the last time you shared the gospel? When was the last time you went and offered peace between God and sinners and you brought salt? Just using all the imagery we're learning about. Now again, make sure you understand the question. I did not ask, because this is the way most of us take it. I didn't ask, when was the last time you were nice to someone? Because that's what we assume sharing the gospel is. And that's really the problem. We have confused the gospel with our definition of morality. Our definition of right and wrong and what's good and acceptable. And again, if you help a sweet little old lady cross the road, that's a good thing, right? But if you didn't tell her about Christ along the way, guess what? You didn't share the gospel with her. You did something that was gospel-like... You know, that's good news, Tim. You made sure she got around the roundabout downtown Farmington. Because that's like what Frogger or something did. You see, this is what God has entrusted us to do. Not to walk around and be nice to everybody. You know, you know what happens when that's our definition of the gospel? When our definition of the gospel is, hey, I'm going to be nice to you and hope that it rubs off Maybe you'll come and hang out in my church. And maybe you'll get baptized and you'll start tithing and all that stuff. If that's our definition of the gospel, guess what? Our gospel is going to change depending on what's nice, according not to us, but the culture. Do you get it? And we're always trying to conform. Every wave of doctrine... And we see that happening in our culture, in our nation, in our communities right now. Big time. And what are Christians doing? Well, I want to be nice. I don't want to, you know, upset people. So I'm going to conform to that. Whatever they say is good, even though their definition of what is good is nowhere near found in Scripture. But, you know, for the love of God, I just want to make sure that I can still have some kind of communication with them. And so what do we do? We lose the power of the gospel because now we're no longer proclaiming the gospel. We're just hanging out with people and being nice. And nice changes depending on who we're hanging out with. God did not entrust you with the ministry of being nice. He didn't. He didn't call you to be a jerk either. But he called you to to go share gospel, something very specific. Which even in our own minds is like, man, that sounds like a jerk. It's not. It's the love of God. And it takes men and women and children, young people of faith, to go and boldly share that. So God has entrusted you with this message of reconciliation. The peace offering seasoned with salt. Christ sacrificed on the cross for the sins of the world. This is what it means to be the salt of of the earth, church, is to know and consistently, faithfully share gospel. 
Now look at verse 13 again. You are the salt of the earth. Now we know what that means. It doesn't mean like, oh, you're going to go preserve society by engaging it and dominating everything. No, it doesn't mean that. You are the salt of the earth. I'm going to go be a peace offering and share that with the world. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled, trampled under people's feet. Do you see our Lord's question there? And I'm paraphrasing, but, but what if the salt has lost its taste? Okay, keep everything we've learned in mind thus far. One, we, the church, we are the salt of the earth. Two, salt was used to season the peace offering in the Old Testament. Three, Jesus is the fulfillment of the peace offering by sacrificing himself on the cross for our sins. And he made reconciliation between God and man possible. Four, we have been entrusted with this message of reconciliation. With the gospel, with salt, a peace offering. We're supposed to go share that. Now then, Jesus asked the question, what if the salt has lost its taste? Let's unpack that for a bit. Lost its taste is really just one word in Greek. Moraino. And it means to become foolish, like, forgive me, moron. I know we find that word offensive, yeah? But that's where the word comes from. To become foolish, nonsensical, and in this context, it means to become defiled, mixed up. You see, pure salt can never lose its taste. But when it is mixed, defiled, if you will, with other minerals, well, as our Lord states it, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. In other words, the gospel, the peace that we offer between God and man is useless unless it is the pure gospel found exclusively in Scripture. Salvation by grace through faith alone. That's it. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Paul points this out, Galatians Chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Look at what he says. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to, what does he call it? A different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So again, is this a possibility? Are there those within churches that are going to preach a gospel that is a different gospel than the one we find in Scripture? According to Paul, the answer is yes. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. So how do we keep the salt? Because that's, that's the definition. There is the possibility, the salt, the gospel, the peace offering between a holy God and sinful men, there is the possibility of that gospel losing its taste, being defiled, Becoming a different gospel that is powerless to save. Do you see what I'm getting at? So how do we keep the gospel from going there? How do we keep the salt from losing its taste and ensure its purity? Here's the answer. Simply go to the Bible. There you will discover who Jesus is. And this is what Scripture tells us. He was perfectly God and perfectly man in one. The Bible will tell you what He did for sinners like ourselves. Jesus lived a sinless life. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He died for our sins. 1 John 4.10 And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then lastly, Jesus rose from the dead. Luke 24.6 He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. This is the peace offering seasoned with salt. 
the good news of Jesus Christ. By faith alone, God declares you righteous in Christ. By faith alone, God forgives you of all of your sins. By faith alone, God guarantees you eternal life. And then we see this in Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Saved, rather. So what do we do with all that? How does this truth enable you to biblically and effectively engage with our culture, our fallen world? It's real simple. Go share the good news. Go share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Point to him as the peace offering, the only one that can bring reconciliation between God and sinful man. As our Lord said, you are, we are the salt of the earth. You want to change your home, your neighborhood, your community? This is where we begin. With men and women hearing the gospel, repenting of their sins, following Christ. Everything else is insignificant in comp comparison to that. Now then, secondly and lastly and extremely quickly, remember you are the light of the world, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Again, right there at the outset, verse 14, Jesus is addressing his disciples and by extension, us, his church. And so this is for you. You are the light of the world. So then what does that mean? How do we live that out? First of all, you have to understand what the Lord meant by light in this context. The Greek word for it is phos. And in this context, it actually refers to the reflection of light, not the source. Think along the lines of the full moon reflecting the light of the sun on a clear, dark night. The moon, in and of itself, zero, no light. But when the sun hits it just right, it's like downtown Las Vegas in Blanco or something, right? Like, boom, you can see it, a reflection. In the same way, in and of ourselves, we have no light. There's nothing that, about us that can save anyone. We're powerless to save or change a single life. And yet, despite our lack of luster, Jesus said, we are the light, you are the light of the world. The reflection of God's glory in the darkness that allows the world to see Him through us. To see Him for who He truly is. Charles Spurgeon captured this imagery with perfection when he said, and here's the quote, like the moon, we borrow our light. Bright as we are when grace shines on us, we are darkness itself when the sun of righteousness withdraws himself. Now then, I don't have time. As I said, we're, we're kind of running and gunning this morning. But I, I don't have time to unpack all of, uh, of this particular section. So I'll leave us with this, this final ad, admonition that has to do with light. It's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is who you're supposed to be, salt and light. I know some of you have probably thought, hey, you know what, Tim, this did no good for where I'm at in my life right now. My marriage is in ruins. My children are unruly. I have a terrible job, and I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I have family that are very ill. Some have died, and I'm grieving, and I'm broken. Now you're talking about being salt and light? How does that affect any of these things? Anything in my personal life, how does that help me? How does that encourage me? Here's why. Because without the salt, in all of those situations, there's no hope of peace in your home, your family, your community. It's never going to happen. 
And we're not talking on grand scales. We're talking you faithfully sharing salt with one individual, God saving them, changing them, and transforming everything around them as a result. In the same way, being light, you are that light. You share truth. You share gospel. And God, in his sovereign grace, saves and changes the lives around you. So it is the answer to your failing marriage. The gospel is the answer to your children in bringing them upright. The gospel is the answer for our community. All the crime, all the drugs, all the hate. Jesus Christ has called you and I to be salt and light. And that is the answer. And God is calling us on this hill, Grace Hill, to do that very thing. And we have that opportunity. We always have. But this year, with intent and with earnest, you and I must sharpen those swords. We must get after it. We must put on the armor of God. And we must go and be salt and light. Other churches are getting about it as well in our community. It's not only us that have this figured out like, hey, we got to do something and we have the right tools, the right weapons to actually be in it. My fear isn't, not, isn't that, hey, other churches aren't doing it and we have to lead the way. No, my fear is we're going to be left behind. We need to get in the thick of it. Come off this lofty hill and go be salt and light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to be our peace offering, to be salt for us, to remind us of our covenant relationship with you. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ alone is the light of the world and that you and your sovereign grace, you allowed us to see that light. We could see our sins and We repented and we trusted in Christ. And now, Father, you have called us to be salt and light. I pray that you would, throughout the course of of this year, 2022, equip us, encourage us, enable us, Father, to go be salt and light in Farmington, throughout San Juan County, wherever we may go, Father. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. Help us go. Be salt and light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take a moment now and just reflect. And perhaps you need to repent. Confess your sins. Prepare your hearts for communion. And as we do that, and we partake, and we see like this, this is a picture of that peace offering. He offered up his body. He shed his blood. And now we're going to ingest that. We're going to take that in. We're going to taste and know that God is good. And this is our peace offering. And this is a great time for us to commit. I'm going to go be salt and light. As Christ came, lived, died, and rose again for me, he's called me to be salt and light. And so as you take the time to confess and repent, you remember who God has called you to be. You come.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that in your, your grace, extreme mercy, you've called us to be salt and light. Father, I pray that you would give us all courage, clarity, passion for your gospel. More importantly, passion for those that are lost around us, for our community. Burden us with love for them, Father. That we can be salt and light. In Jesus' name, amen. The body of Christ offered up for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. My brother. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for your message this morning. So this morning, we're, we're going to spend just a few minutes to talk through some of the uh, accomplishments we had in the ministry over 2021. And one of those important elements was a church planner that we support, Pastor Tim, um, partially trained out in Africa and Sierra Leone. And uh, Pastor Kojo um, so sweetly named his church Grace Hill Church in Africa as a way to honor us. We were like, you don't have to name it the same thing, but he did. So I've, he's a sweet man. We, we converse on Facebook all the time. And it's wild how technology is now. You know, back in the day, you'd have to like ship out a VHS and hopefully the missionary gets it back to you. He sent us a video this morning. So he wanted us to see it. And so if you would, Taylor, um, go and make sure that volume's nice and good. And Mia, if you can hit that slide, we're gonna get an update. Um, I am here this afternoon in order to express my gratitude to the entire leadership of Grace Hill Church, um, USA, New Mexico, um, Farmington. I want to thank you how far you've been helping us by praying with us and also supporting us um, financially. I am greatly, greatly, greatly thankful. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for all you've been doing despite the, the challenges posed as a result of the outbreak of the pandemic in the globe. Yet still, some churches were closed, you know, despite the, lock, the lockdown around the globe. Yet still, you remain um, supporting us prayerfully and also um, financially, even though we have challenges. Um, I also want to thank um, past, Pastor Timothy Castillo, who came to Sierra Leone in 2018 to lecture at the Grace Bible Institute, um, Waterloo. And then all of the sudden, God connected us in a mysterious way, which me myself, I could not tell. And thereafter, Gracie Church was actually established. I really, I really want to thank you for all that, for all what you've been doing for us here in Sierra Leone. Um, um, Africa, Sierra Leone to be specific, you know. Um, the church, Gristle Church, we are going on, even though we have challenges, but yet still, God is still keeping us. I really want to thank you all. I am here to express my gratitude on behalf of the church, on behalf of my family. Thank you all. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I am Kojo George. Very good. So that is Kojo George. And so he is a church planner in Sierra Leone, Leone, Africa. And so we're able to actually fully fund a pastor and a ministry at $200 a month. And so it's a pretty, pretty amazing what you can do in, par in parts of this world with what we did, the U.S. consider very little money. And so what we wanted to move into now is so we are, so if you're not familiar with Grace Hill Church, you're new to us. We're glad that you're here. Uh, so Grace Hill Church, we are elder-led, and so we're an elder-led church, and so the elders of Grace Hill Church right now is Pastor Tim, Pastor Stephen, and myself, and so, but we do, uh, by our bylaws, we vote on the budget every year, and part of that is just wanting to make sure everybody's aware of everything, so everything's above board, everything's just shared, and so uh, what uh, Stephen's uh, passing out right now is actually a full budget proposal. And then you'll actually also see actual numbers uh, for 2021. You'll see actually 2020, 2019, 2018. And so just we want to take this time to be completely open 
about the books, about if you have questions about where your giving is being spent, it's all there, and so in, in all full detail. Uh, you'll also, I didn't, I'm not going to pass it out, but there's some on the back table on your way out. If you want to see, this is, a, this is a management report printout from QuickBooks, and so it has all the detail, also has full balance sheet, everything's in there, so if you say, hey, I would like to see all that detail, grab one. Grab one, and then if you have questions, come ask me. I'd love to, to share that with you and so answer any questions that you have. So I know not all nonprofits, not all churches do this, and so it may be a little bit different if you're coming from somewhere else, but we just want to share everything. And so uh, what I want to do now is walk through kind of what's happened in 2021, and then we'll, we'll talk about the budget for 2022, and then at the end we will uh, we'll vote on it. So we'll take a motion, take a second, and then we'll, we'll vote on it, have questions, and that's, this is an opportunity as a congregation, as a faith family, really. It's kind of like a family budget, right, for us to all talk about together. And so if you have questions about it, ask. And so the three of us want to just be an open book to answer any question that you might have. And if you're like, hey, I don't think that's a question that I want to ask in a big group, grab me after this. would love to answer those one-on-one -on -one as well. So let's run through the slides. We can go to that next slide just to give you a little bit of – so. Uh, core values. And so, again, if you're new to Grace Hill Church, we say these are our core values. So, the three core values of Grace Hill Church is that we're going to be biblical. You're going to find that week after week that as Pastor Tim preaches, typically today was a little bit of a, a one-off sermon. Normally, we're going through books of the Bible. Pastor Tim is an expository preacher, and so we're going to bleed the Bible. So, you're going to see thorough verse-by-verse -verse teaching, and we're going to bleed the Bible. And we want to bleed the Bible in every aspect of Grace Hill Church, from Sunday morning worship to Wednesday night with our youth who are, who are studying through books of the Bible, through the Awana program, and really the Awana program is really about writing God's Word on their heart. Uh, my youngest actually goes to Pinion Hill School, and she said this last week they were doing a, a Bible game, and so she knew all the verses, and the, the guy that was leading at the end said, okay, how many of you kids did Awanas? And she was like one of two kids, and, and she, she did really well. And so there's something to be said about writing God's word on your heart. And that's, that's what Awanas does. And so it's part of, part of that being biblical and bleeding the Bible uh, is, is what's something that Spurgeon had said. Uh, we want to be relational. And so Grace Hill Church's goal is to be relational. And that's relational with God the Father and then relational with one another. And so you'll hear us use language here as faith family, is that it is, it is a faith family that we want to live life together. And so that's through, through home groups through Sunday morning, through activities on Wednesday night, but really transparent relationships that, that it's not just about we go and we sit in rows and we don't know each other's lives, but we move from sitting in rows to sitting in circles that we would know one another and know each other's lives, that we can care about one another whenever, whenever things get hard because life's not always easy, is it? And then lastly is transformation, is the goal of Grace Hill Church is to be salt and light, as Pastor Tim just preached, and so that you would see transformation so that we would see transformed lives in ourselves, we'd see it in one another, and we'd see it ultimately in our community in Farmington, San Juan County, and throughout the region. The next slide. So 2021 highlights uh, internally, home groups uh, going really strong, and so there's currently three home groups, a home group that meets at the home of the Skeens, uh, there's, uh, one that, there's two that meet here up at the church on Sunday night, uh, we are looking for more home groups. There is a need. So if you said, hey, I'd love to host a home group or I'd like to lead a home group, see one of us. And we'd love to, to you know, help guide you into that, whether that's training, and then move forward into adding more home groups. Uh, Grace Hill Kids, and so the Awana program, Grace Hill Kids on Sunday morning has gone really well. Uh, Grace Hill Teens, and so the McGuire's have done a great job of continuing to lead Grace Hill uh, teens, as well as having the homers jump in there with them, has been really great this year. And they're actually on Wednesday nights dividing out. So they're going to divide out the high schoolers and the middle schoolers because that group has grown to, to needing to divide those age groups out. And then there's been many life transformations. And so lots of baptisms this year, just lots of life transformation. And then just normal church life. And so some struggles and then also just a lot of, a lot of beautiful stuff in normal church life. Next slide. Uh, externally, I've done ministry at Coronado Apartments. So Coronado Apartments is over at the corner of 30th Street and Dustin. And so it's an apartment complex that we've kind of adopted throughout the years. And so we're able to do backpacks uh, for Christmas. We're able to sponsor uh, several families over there. And so people just, 
Yeah, that apartment complex has gotten to the point of whenever they have hard stuff going on in the complex, they call. And so, and then we're able as, as a faith family to respond to the needs over there. Uh, Sierra Leone, you just saw uh, Kojo George, there's an orphanage associated with that. And so we help sponsor uh, that orphanage over there. And then next, looking at church planning. And so Higher Ground is going, going really well. And so uh, that's uh, Josh Valdez at Higher Ground. So Higher Ground is a church plant. It happened a couple of years ago over on top of Harper Hill. And so that church is, is doing really well, becoming self-sufficient. We're still helping fund that church, um, but, but it's less, and they're, they're, in a really, they're in a really great spot. So that church is, is doing really well. And then again, Sierra Leone, West Africa, which you, you heard Kojo talk about. And then the Four Corners Collective, that's something that uh, Pastor Tim's involved in. And so it's a, a group of pastors throughout our region, really uh, Durango, Cortez, Farmington, kind of uh, regionally. And that group is one living life together and helping encourage one another uh, in, in their own ministries. And then as well as talking about church planning on, on a regional level. And so next. And now the money. And so uh, total income for 2021 uh, was $240,000. Uh, total expenses was two fifty one, dollars And so we did have a loss this year. It's the first time we've had a loss that I know of in, in eight years. And so our, our cash situation is really good. And so we did take on really a new ministry this year. So uh, Steph Castillo took on, uh, we opened Grace Hill Counseling Center this year. And so there's a salary associated with that and there's advertising. And so it's almost like a little business, if you will. And so it was year one. So we had billing. You can see it actually on that sheet that I handed out. There's $17,000 in billing to a cost of about $50,000. So it, it lost money this year to be expected. You know, they say, you know, normally first year businesses lose money. And so I would assume that, you know, so we did budget for this year that it'll break even. And so tell, there's definitely a need for counseling in this community. And so there's a huge need for biblical counseling and stuff does a great job with it. And so I think as, as awareness grows, it'll get to where it break e breaks even. And it's so, so this year, Faith Family, you, you sponsored, you, you sponsored a, a ministry of counseling to our community. And so I see that as a really good thing. And so the goal of this is, is not for it to be a big profit center for the church. And really, so it's a way for us to serve our community with, with really great counseling that's, that's certified. And so bringing this to Farmington, which I think has been a desperate need for a long, long time. And so, so that's going on. So I think, so you see, so most of that loss was actually right, was right there. Actually, it was there. And so we actually helped compensate for that. But again, our cash position is really good. And so there's still $165,000 in, uh, in the bank, if you will. And so we're still in a really good cash position. And so what a blessing, you know, of, of the past that we can, we can lose this money this year and it, it be okay. So any questions about that? And again, you can see all the detail. You have all that detail in your hand. Like I said, if you want to grab, this has even more detail in it that's actually out of the QuickBooks. So any questions about the money for 2021? You say uh, giving was down a little bit. Uh, giving was uh, was down from 2020. It's interesting that COVID year 2020, our giving was really up. And so our giving was about right in line with 2019. And so 2021 was right in line. Almost giving was within almost $1,000. That's pretty interesting. Great. Well, let's move on to 2022. So here's the budget. So the budget for, uh, for 2022 is... You know, mission twenty nine thousand dollars towards mission, uh, one hundred fifty seven thousand dollars towards personnel, uh, facility thirty five thousand uh, dollars, ministry supply uh, eighteen thousand uh, dollars. Ministry supply is uh, TC groups and uh, Awana ministry and you know communion and all the different kind of things that go along with that. So total expenses uh, two thirty nine, so about two thousand dollars more is what I expect compared to what the actual was of twenty twenty one. The only thing that's not in here that is happening, uh, we are re roofing the building, and so all the flat roofing part of the building. And if you'll notice, there's some of that drop ceiling that's swollen, swollen down, and it's gotten gotten wet as our roof has needed to be replaced. We've patched it, and patched it, and patched it. To my knowledge, for the last seven years, and it's time for a new one. 
And so that's a $50,000 expense. And he's actually starting this week. And so certified roofing is, is starting that. So that's not in the budget. So we're actually, I figure that's a capital expenditure. So we'll use our existing cash. And so in a normal business that pays taxes, we would depreciate that. And so a little bit different in a nonprofit where you don't really have to depreciate expenses because you're not paying taxes on it. Um, anyway, so, so there's, there's 50,000 that's gonna be coming out of our, our current cash uh, to re-roof that building. But I anticipate that roof was the original roof when Jane's built this building in 1985. So for a roof to last from 85 to 2022, it's done its job, right? And so I think certified will, Brandon will do a good job of re-roofing this and it's a 40 year roof as well. So if we can, for 50 grand, we can get another 40 years out. That's a good thing and stop having leaks in our rooms and the mess that goes with that. So any questions about expenses? You have all the detail in your hand. Happy to answer any of those. Um, we're not gonna give any raises this year to our, uh, to our personnel, to our staff. Uh, Steven is going to cut his back even a little bit. You can see that in the numbers there. Y'all call yourselves Baptist. Come on, you're supposed to be a fight or something. We have some gloves. Get them out. So, so jump on over to income. So, and so 2022. So here's where the income will come from. So. Uh, Awana takes in a little, a little bit of money. Uh, we still have, so the, these are cell towers. So the tower behind us is a cell tower. The middle cross of the three crosses are cell phone towers. Uh, we sold those um, eight years ago. This is actually year nine. So uh, we got $44,000 in income. This last year they paid us $89,000. Again, same thing that happened the year before. We called them and said, you've, over, you've double paid, you've overpaid. And they, they told me you're stupid and you don't know how cell phone towers work. Just cast the checks, so okay. So I don't know how to argue with that. I guess I just admit I'm stupid, so I'm okay with that. And so those cell towers are a blessing. This is year nine of a 10-year payout for those. Uh, Grace Hill Counseling, you see we took in $17,000. Um, the goal is to grow that to 48,000 this year, and so how that's happening is there's some of the marketing through social media, as well as Steph is, is going out and seeing businesses. So she's seeing uh, businesses trying to see at least one a week, and just to let them know it's available. And so I think there's, there's a lot of HR, a lot of small businesses that don't have HR that are out of their realm, and so counseling is a way that to build in, and we've set up a, a special program where there's some discounts for businesses to pay for four sessions uh, for people. Uh, general giving, so we'll need general giving to go up a little bit, and so we need to go from 133 to 147. And so not a lot of extra giving, but we do need a little bit extra giving to make the budget balance. And so total income 240, and again, my goal is always just a balanced budget so that we're not, we're not hemorrhaging money, but you know, as a church, we want to be faithful, again, to be salt and light to our community. So any questions about kind of the income side? All right, that, that may be, is that the last slide? Is there another one? That's it? Okay. So that's it. So that's, that's our budget. That's kind of what's gone on in 2021, what our plan is for 2022. Just continue to, to love this community, love one another, love God, and be salt and light. Any questions you have of Pastor Tim or myself or Stephen? Well, if nothing, if there's no discussion, we'll, I'll take a motion to approve the budget as presented. I have a motion. Mariah. I have a motion on the floor by, by Mariah. Uh, can I get a second? I, I got a second Several. by Michael. Good. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. So all those in favor of approving the budget as presented, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none. Okay. And again, if there are questions you have that you would rather ask in private, you can either talk to us afterwards, call us a week from now. It doesn't matter. We want to be transparent as we can be. So you just let us know, all right? We sure do thank you. We love you all. And so you want to pray us out, brother? Sure. Okay. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Father, thank you for how you've blessed Grace Hill Church. Lord, beyond measure. And Father, that you would just help each one of us just to be faithful. 
Lord, be, we'd be faithful in, in the way that we are salt and light to this community. Lord, thank you for the way you love us. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.